Hello everyone. The Burning Legion has evaded Azeroth once again, and the monks were hit hard at the Peak of Serenity, where we shut down their portal causing a massive explosion, and we barely made it out alive. Thankfully, Shenzin Zhu, the giant turtle, was wandering nearby and able to pick us up, but Grandmaster Heights was not so lucky. His spirits now rest with the ancestors, while we're appointed to be the new leader and take charge of the monks in the war against the Legion. To aid us with this task, three powerful artifacts are waiting to be obtained, and for the Windmalker monk, it's the Fist of the Heavens. Travelers returned to the Isle from abroad, they brought with them an intriguing tale. They describe an ancient pair of hand blades set to grant the better the power of the storm. Little is known about these mysterious weapons, but if the legends are true, we should consider searching for them. Now that's a great idea and all, yet they're unable to find any records about this weapon. They've checked and rechecked and can find barely a shred of a tale. This can only mean that the story comes from a land outside of Pandaria. I mean, the story could also be a lie, but who am I to judge? And Lily Stormstout is young, but she is the most traveled on the entire isle, with the exception of course for us. If anyone might know of this weapon, it is she, so we pop into the Laughing Crane, where Lily is hanging out with her family. She's a bit pissy, since all they do is hang around in the tavern all day instead of exploring the world. Very boring, so maybe we can offer some adventure as we ask her about the weapon. She has heard tales of it as she was traveling with her uncle Chen before they found their way to Pandaria and she'd love to go see if that story is true. But Pop's here, he's too busy stuffing his guts and being grouched to let her go do any real exploring. He even told her that she can't leave the village unless she has a guardian. Is Pop's for real? She can protect herself just fine. Take me with you! She pleads with us to be her guardian and get her away from this boredom. If we do, we'd totally be her hero. All right, let's go. Okay, Pop, it's been... It's been something. I need to get on with my travels. Lily, I told you I don't want you going off on your own again. I thought you might say that. Look, I have a guardian, and it's even the master of the monks. I'll be fine. Clearly, nothing I say is going to change your mind. Fine. Go on your adventure. Just come back to me unharmed. Yay! Okay, let's go! My friend, Mr. Crane, can fly me to Uldum. Here, you can use my kite to follow us. Okay, Mr. Crane, here's two juicy fish if you'll take me ah! to Uldum. Uh-uh. You get one now, and one when we get there. No complaining. So off we go to Uldum to talk with King Perowitz, who has heard of a strange storm that has appeared over the ruins. What's more, he is told that an elemental called Nether, he has attacked his people in nearby lands. These events must be related, so he wants us to find Nether, put an end to him, and search his body for clues. As we go about doing that, let's talk about the history behind this weapon we're after, and why it can be found in Uldum. This is so cool! There are tales of an ancient weaponsmith, a master without peer amongst the Tolvir. His name was Irmat, and his name is known to all the surviving Tolvir as one of the most exceptional minds to have lived in Uldum, and also a cautionary lesson. Irmat was driven to create incredible works, but his pride turned out to be his undoing. It was the Titans, or more specifically the Titan Keepers, who created the Tolvir to protect key locations across Azeroth. Over the millennia, some of them fell to the force of darkness, and for a very, very long time, Uldum did not. Irmat, its weaponsmith, worked tirelessly to arm his brethren with the finest instruments possible. For him, his work was not simply a duty, it was his calling. He saw his hands as an extension of the Titan's will, and he wanted nothing less than to give his creations the ability to restore order to all chaos. He began to imbue his weapons with magic, using different sources of power to inspire him. The power of air in particular held a special interest to him. He secretly observed the sky wall, the realm of air in the elemental plane, and he studied the ways its creatures lived and fought. Irma had forged four scimitars, representing four extraordinary jinn lords. And then, in a ritual that stunned the Tolvir with its audacity, Irma had summoned and bound those four lords within the weapons themselves. Their power now belonged to the Tolvir. Irma's four scimitars became highly coveted amongst the Tolvir warriors. Stories of their powers rapidly spread, and messages came from other Tolvir outposts, begging Irma for more of these wonders. But the weaponsmith's satisfaction was very short-lived. He had accomplished something great, but it was not perfect. Irma had seen for himself the true elemental power of the Skywall. 
Even the captured might of these four jinns was but a light breeze compared to the ultimate power of that realm. He began to carefully craft two new weapons, not scimitars this time, two smaller weapons, one to be held in each hand. He named them Alburk and Alraet, and he intended for them to control a power that, by its nature, could never be tamed. After Irma had forged his new weapons, he declared them to be his finest work. These Fist of the Heavens would be capable of Command of the Wind itself. All that was left was to capture the ultimate power within the Skywall, the Elemental Lord Elakir. Irmat began the ritual slowly, not wanting to warn the Windlord of his plans. It took weeks of preparations, but once he was ready, it was over in an instant. The Weaponsmith cast his spell, intending to open a portal to the Skywall and bind Elakir's essence. There was a great flash of light and a great rush of air, and when it was done, he could feel the weapons trembling with elemental power. He believed he had succeeded. He believed that he accomplished the impossible. His surety was what led to his eventual death. Of all the elemental lords, Elakir was known to be the cleverest. When Irmat captured four of his most prized lieutenants, the Windlord was filled with wrath, but he recognized an opportunity to exact vengeance. He suspected that the Weaponsmith's pride would drive him onward. When Irmat's spell concluded, he felt Alakir's power quivering, but it was not the elemental lord's spirit, it was actually Alakir's trap. When he hefted his two weapons and tested the power within them, uncontrollable fury spilled forth. The weaponsmith, his forge and a number of buildings within Uldum were destroyed by the hurricane of might that had been unleashed. The weapons themselves were hurled miles away and the unfortunate Tolveer, who first tried to recover them, they were similarly destroyed. Elakir had made Irmat's greatest creations unusable, filled with so much power that nobody could ever hope to control them. So instead, the Tolveer carefully locked the weapons away, burying them deep and hoping that they would be forgotten. For millennia, nobody dared to touch them or repeat Irmat's folly. Elakir's lesson had been learned very well. And then the events of the Cataclysm took place that changed the world of Azeroth forever. Up to this point, Uldum had been shrouded by magic, hidden away from the eyes of mortals, but the Cataclysm, it damaged the ancient Titan device that separated Uldum and revealed it to the world. The remnants of the Tolvir, they came under assault. Elakir and Ragnaros were slain by Azeroth's champions. We've only begun to feel the ripple effects of those events, but what we do know is that the death of Alakir, it left a power vacuum amongst the air elementals. His surviving subordinates, they went to war with one another, scrambling to secure leadership of Skywall. None found any immediate advantage, for none were as powerful or as clever as their master had been. But one Jin, Typhinius, he sensed that there were still scraps of Elakir's power out there. Lingering rifts in the Skywall allowed Typhinius to leave quietly and hunt for something that would elevate him above his kin, the Fist of the Heavens. He let his senses guide him, and he was led to an empty, nondescript part of the desert outside Uldum. When he dug into the sand, he found what the Tolvir had tried to hide away, Irmat's last creation. Typhinius realized that although Alakir was dead, the weapon's elemental chaos remained, but it seems to be slightly, just slightly more stable than when the Windlord lived. Still, when the Jin first wielded the weapons, the resulting burst of power, it nearly destroyed him. But slowly and secretly, Typhinius learned how to keep his old master's power under control. When he eventually did return to Skywall with the Fist of Heavens in his grasp, he immediately set out to end the Air Elemental Civil War. It was not simply his raw power that quelled the Elementals, they sensed the essence of their old master and it compelled them to obey. There were those who refused, of course. Other Jinns believed that they could band together and overcome Typhenius' borrowed strength. A huge battle nearly ripped apart the Vortex Pinnacle, and a brutal clash in the Temple of Assad, it saw tremendous losses on all sides. In the end, Typhenius was not the cleverest, he was simply the strongest, and he overpowered his enemies. He flung the spirits of those who opposed him into the other elemental realms. There, all by themselves, they could not stop their natural enemies from finishing them off in a slow and agonizing fashion. Typhenius declared, that he was the rightful heir to Alakir and that he would finish what the Windlord had started. The war in the Skywall, it had caused more damage than Typhinius realized. It would take time for the air elementals to regain their strength and prepare for the full offensive, but he had no interest in waiting. The moment he felt the Burning Legion invade Azeroth, he knew that the mortal champions of the world, they would be preoccupied. He told his minions that there'd be no better time to attack, so the raids on Uldum began almost immediately. With the power of the Fist of the Heavens, they swept away all early resistance. Typhinius' early assault on Uldum, it's a serious strategic error, since the Civil 
war has not long passed and the fighting power of the air elementals is still weaker than it might be in only a few months. On top of that, he has not mastered the weapon's true potential yet. He can unleash carnage, but most of his efforts are spent on keeping Alakir's fury from ripping him apart. With his early assault, he has drawn attention to himself. We are now aware of his plans and on the dead body of Nether at the ruins of Hamtul, we find the essence of the whirlwind. This stone is saturated with elemental power, possibly the remnant of the magic used against Irmat. Holding the stone aloft, it unleashes the stone's essence as a mighty whirlwind, so powerful that it carries us and Lily all the way to the sky wall, where Typhineus and the Fist of the Heavens can certainly be found. Get me out of this thing! Uh oh My head still feels like it's spinning! Oh, hey, what's going on over there? Hello? Hi! Mortals in my domain! They must not disrupt my plans! Slaughter them! Hmm, they don't look so happy to see us. Hmm, these tornadoes simply won't do. Wanna see a trick my Uncle Chen taught me? Pretty neat, huh? Look at those big, sparking orbs! I wonder what happens if we poke one. Hey! It's that big, ugly guy again. Puny mortals! You tread in my realm now! There is no one to save you! Blah, blah, blah. You know, you sure do talk a lot. Insolent whelps! Witness the powers at my command! Aborak! What I here! A small victory. Enjoy it while you can. Come forth, servants of the storm! Defend your master! Oh, can't we all just get along? No? Okay then, you asked for it. Nasser! Answer your master's call! Unacceptable! Melazan, destroy them, or I will cast your miserable essence to Deep Holm! These mortals will not die! Zaurak, defend your master! Holy smokes! Dragon! It's taking off! Or not. And never tell Uncle Chen I was this high up, okay? Are all of my servants weaklings? Fine. I shall end you myself. 
my winds shall rip you apart! Whoa, this guy is like super tough! Do you think we can beat him? Yeah! You got this! That was awesome! I was like, oh no! And you were like, uh, leave it to me! We explored the desert, punched a dragon in the face, and even got you something shiny. Uh, uh, all this adventure is making me sleepy. Let's head back to the Wandering Isle. That was indeed a fantastic trip. We should really do this kind of thing more often, Lily says, and she's going to stick around here for a while and eventually becomes one of our champions. That's a tale for later though. For now, we've obtained the Fist of the Heavens. Its history is marked with pride. Pride of its creator and pride of Typhineus that drew the attention which led to us discovering his plans. He launched his war way too soon and even these weapons could not save him. The power that they contain can only be harnessed by a balanced mind and a harmonious spirit. Any arrogance, any cockiness will inevitably lead to ruin for their wielders. But if you are already practiced in walking with the wind, the fist of the heavens will finally have a master who can make them truly legendary. And we surely will as we adventure on the broken isles and continue our war against the burning legion. However, those are the story for another day. So for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!